or Ecuador and you ask someone about Islam and Muslims, one of the first things they will say is Osama bin Laden. Even in that village, in a place in a remote area, in the middle of mountains, middle of nowhere, they will know Osama bin Laden. They will say, oh Muslims, okay, these are very violent and barbaric people, right? They blow up buses and tubes and, and buildings. So this is what the conception of Islam is. Whether it's a conception or a misconception is another question we will discuss in due course. So many questions are being asked about Islam and its nature. Islam has suddenly become uh, a threat to the current uh, geopolitical order in the world. Islam has suddenly become a threat to growing uh, secularist movements such as atheism or liberalism or humanism. So Islam is being attacked for a number of different reasons. Okay? There are other motives, political motives, which I will not go into at this stage. And if during the Q&A you want to bring up these motives, we'll talk about it. So what are these misconceptions people are spreading about Islam? One of the biggest misconceptions about Islam is that Islam is violent. By default. Period. The first thing you hear about Islam is... Uh, or oh, the word with Islam, you see the word which comes to your mind is terrorism. Somehow, the Muslims have become, have become uh, terrorists, as if we are the ones who invented terrorism. Well, that's not the case, because this conception or this misconception of Islam didn't exist before the 90s. It didn't exist before the 1990s, when Cold War was at its peak between the West and the Russians, and it's now about to start again. Thanks to the Ukrainians. Okay? So, before that, this conception didn't exist. Suddenly, after the 1990s, after the Gulf War, then we had uh, uh, the Taliban issue in 1994 when the Taliban took over Afghanistan, and then we had 2001, you know, the great catastrophe, the greatest catastrophe in the history of mankind, even though millions of people died during the transatlantic slave trade, when uh, over 20 million people were taken, taken across the Atlantic from Africa um, from, uh, to, towards uh, the Americas, and most of these people died in a very miserable state. We don't hear anything about them. And there are other millions of massacres which took place in the history of mankind, such as the Native Americans, who were systemically wiped out, right? And then we have other massacres such as those in Africa uh, in the early 20th century or the Second World War and the First World War. We don't hear about them. But September the 11th has a very special place in the history of mankind. We will hear about this incident, although very unfortunate, no doubt. Very, very unfortunate. But we will hear about this incident for political reasons for the coming three generations, at least in my view. As if no other catastrophes took place in the history of mankind. So this happened and then wars kicked off and then Islamic terrorism arose for whatever reasons. So one of the conceptions people are um, fostering about Islam is that Islam promotes terrorism. Although this conception was absent from our minds and from mainstream media before the 1990s. It may have been there but not on this scale, the scale we witnessed on the media today. So, is it true? That's the question. Is this conception true? Does Islam promote terrorism? Does Islam promote killings of innocent people? Does Islam promote killing of people traveling in buses or going to work in buildings? Well, this is a clear misconception on the part of the masses. Uh, I don't blame the masses. It is our job, the Muslims, who have to clarify the picture. Because the people who are trying to portray this picture of Islam are very, very powerful. They have the voice, they have the means, and they have the money, which we, the Muslim masses, do not have. So we have to work harder. We have to come out and we have to speak to the masses and tell them that this is clearly not the case. Why? Because our history testifies to this fact. We, the Muslims, governed the world for over a thousand years. We dominated the world politically. Whether it were the Umayyads or the Abbasids or the Ottomans, we dominated the world politically, uh, especially the civilized world that we call today on the Mediterranean Sea, this belt uh, of business and economics. We dominated it as Muslims, right? And our history is very, very clear. During this 
age of domination, the Muslims had Christians and Jews and others living under their uh, hegemony. And the Muslims treated them fairly. And I've written a book on this topic, Islam's War on Terror. It's called Islam's War on Terror. And you can if you Google my name uh, uh, with Adnan Rashid. There's another Adnan Rashid that will come up, the Taliban one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have not that Adnan Rashid. Adnan Rashid, the book is titled Islam's War on Terror. And I give all my reasons as to why Islam promotes anything but the killing of innocent people. And the evidence is all there. Why I believe that. I actually believe to the contrary that Islam was one of the best things that happened to mankind. Not according to the Muslims. Of course we're going to say this. We are Muslims. We are biased. And we are prejudiced in that sense. Okay? And I don't claim to be objective. Uh, sorry. Sub, uh, objective. I am truly subjective. I believe Islam is the solution to all the problems mankind is facing today. So I don't claim to be objective today. No one is objective. Anyone who comes here to, uh, and claims that he or she is objective, truly objective, is simply not aware of what objectivity really means. Right? So the point today I'm going to address is that Islam promotes anything but the killings of innocent people. Or terrorism, what we know today as terrorism. So, why I believe that? I believe that because of the core values of Islam. Core values, justice for example. Justice is one of the pillars which was established by the Qur'an. One of the first things when the Qur'an was revealed, uh, was uh, delivered or preached to the masses was the concept of justice. Even though the people who uh, were the primary audience of the Qur'an, uh, they had very little idea of justice. Okay? Well, their justice came from the powerful. The, the powerful, the business people, and uh, the ones who held it. Uh, the keys to the Kaaba, for example, in, in the city of Mecca, they're the ones who made rules, right? And others obeyed. But the Quran comes down and it tells everyone that you are all equal in the sight of Allah. Okay? And leave me alone, please. So, all of these people were following the rules made by the powerful. The Quran comes and tells everyone that you are all equal. And the ones who are special, the ones who are God conscious, taqwa. The ones who are conscious of God. And those who are conscious of God will do justice. So in chapter 5 of the Quran, verse 8, chapter 5, Surah Al-Ma'idah, verse 8, we are told, Ya ayyuhal ladina aman, A'udhu billahi na shaitan al-rajim, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Ya ayyuhal ladina aman, Ukunu qawwamina lillahi shuhada bil qist, Wa la yajrimannakum shana'anu ala qawmin, Ala... Allah ta'adilu. Ta'adilu huwa akrabu li taqwa. Here, Allah, we believe Quran came from God Almighty, the one who created the universe, the one who created the balance in the universe, the one who created or finally tuned the universe. Okay? He is the one who revealed the Quran to communicate with us, to tell us as to what He wants from us. Right? In the Quran, He states, Oh, you believe. Those of you who have believed in Islam, or in this revelation, or in the existence of God, be just. Do justice. Even if you dislike the other. Even if you dislike someone else. Even if you dislike the Jews and the Christians and the atheists and the rest. If you dislike them, do not avoid justice. Because justice is close to God consciousness. So those who are God conscious will have justice. They will do justice. So this is exactly what Islam delivered when it came to power. So we had a golden chain of events in the history of Islam. And this is, according, this is my theory. I propose this theory even in my book. The golden chain of events is the revelation of the Quran. It came down. Okay. Now, I know many people don't believe the Quran came from God. It was a concoction. It was uh, something with Muhammad, peace be upon him, sallallahu alayhi wa put together from different sources, which is another debate altogether. We can talk about it if someone wants to bring it up during the Q&A. But I truly believe that the Quran definitely came from God. It Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, Prophet Muhammad had no capacity to concoct a book like the Quran. He had no capacity. He was born in the middle of the Arabian desert in a in a city which had no libraries, no academies, no schools, and he was receiving this revelation. And then from the Quran, when it was revealed, or when it was delivered to the Arabs, they adopted it. They practiced it. They understood it. And they took it very seriously. 
they applied it. And when they applied it, they had the concept of justice which came from Islam, the Quran. So from this justice emerged peace. From this justice, because these Arabs, the very same Arabs who used to kill their daughters, who used to fight over little things, pity things, right? And they used to worship idols, they used to rob each other, and many uh, negative things were to be found in these people. Also on top of that, there were poets, there were literatures, they were a very hospitable people, they were people of principles in the sense that they would fight and die for the principles. So they had these qualities as well at the same time. Okay, and some of those qualities are still to be found in the Arabs, mashallah. Okay, so, so when the Quran came down, it changed their worldview. They stopped, they stopped thinking about the camels and the goats and the palm trees. They started thinking about the world. It exposed them to, uh, to a world which they, have never, which they had never thought about. This was the first time they started to think about the goodness of humanity. Now we have been given this responsibility by God Almighty to go out and change the world. It is upon us now to go and do something and remove oppression and injustice from the world. So the Quran tells them, Umar sallallahu illa rahmatan lil alameen. We have sent you not, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, except as a mercy for the world. Okay? So you have to now go and change the world. So they came out to change the world. So they changed the geopolitical or socio-political order of the world at that time. So when they went to the Persians, they told them, we have come here to liberate your people. So one of the negotiators on behalf of the Muslims, uh, when he was asked as to why you have come to Persia, you want camels and goats, we'll give you plenty, go back to your desert. He said, no, well, this time we haven't come for camels and goats. This time we have come to liberate your people. And liberated uh, those people were indeed. So, the first chain, or the first uh, point in this chain of events was the Qur'an, the revelation, then the justice of Qur'an which was given to the Arabs, the second, and the third was peace that came from that justice. From that peace came progress, what we know as the golden age of Islam, okay? Uh, the libraries of Damascus and Baghdad and then Cordoba, the largest city on the planet, one million people, 60,000 palaces, over 250,000 houses, a free library, water running through people's homes, people are being taught in the mosque by teachers in turbans and long beards and robes, uh, and these very teachers are replicated, or their teaching are replicated in universities like Oxford and Cambridge and Paris and Boulogne and Naples and all these universities. A lot of these European scholars or students came to learn to become scholars from the Arabs, and then they went back and they introduced this Arabic knowledge uh, in a transformed uh, um, form because the Greeks had already written uh, plenty of works the Greeks had given theory the Arabs experimented they actually worked these theories they, they applied them and they made experiments they did experiments and then they uh, forwarded their corrected form of knowledge which was original in its uh, origin for example the Arabs uh, took knowledge from the Greeks and they fixed it a lot of the Greek knowledge was based upon mistakes and misconceptions. So they studied that knowledge, they fixed it and then tr transferred this knowledge uh, in that form to the Europeans and the Europeans brought this knowledge back to their universities. Hence we had the 12th century Renaissance and some even argue even the 15th, 16th century Renaissance came from uh, directly the Arabs. Uh, one of those people is from uh, the, the, the university, Columbia University in the US. His name is George Saliba. Uh, he's not a Muslim, by the way. He wrote this book titled The Arabic Origins of the Renaissance. Okay? So, the, the European Renaissance actually emerged, in my view, from the Quran. You cannot separate the seed from the tree. Right? So, when you talk about the tree or the fruit, you must also, also talk about the seed. So, the seed was the Quran. The Arabic civilization or the civilization of the Muslims or the Arabs actually came from the Quran. If it wasn't for the Quran, Nothing would have changed. The Arabs still would have been living in the desert with the goats and the camels. They would have continued as they were. But it was the Quran which changed their outlook. Their worldview. The way they viewed the world was changed drastically, beyond recognition. And then they went out and changed the world, having changed themselves first. So, this was not terrorism which did all of this. This was compassion. Um, so, this was a fruit of. The Quran, which promoted all these values. 
that this term terrorism, which is very often equated with Islam, is a recent phenomenon. Okay, it's a very political phenomenon. It is a very uh, beneficial uh, accusation which the enemies of Islam use or enemies of Muslims use nowadays. Possibly they want to get rid of us from Europe. Islam is spreading very fast. Uh, Islam is the fastest growing religion in the Western world. Okay, and majority of the converts to Islam are women because they have seen the value Islam gives to women. Ironically, one of the biggest accusations against Islam is that Islam somehow suppresses the rights of women. Islam oppresses women. Islam forces things on women which they don't like to uh, practice. But amazingly, majority of the converts to Islam are women. In Britain, 70% of the converts to Islam are women. Why? Who is putting a gun to their head? Who has a sword on the head to convert? No one is converting them by force. They are coming to Islam voluntarily and those who do not like the fact that Islam is growing very fast are working very hard to take the masses away from Islam. But the more they push this rubbish down the throats of the masses, the more people want to read about it. The Qur'an has become one of the best sellers. And for that reason, uh, as we are told in the Qur'an, وَمَكَرُوا وَمَكَرَ اللَّهُ وَاللَّهُ خَيْرُ الْمَاكِرِينَ They plan and they plot, and Allah also plans, and He is the best of planners. So when they plan, that plan somehow turns around and does exactly what they're trying to prevent. And that's what's happening in Europe nowadays. The more Islam is being demonized, the more people read about Islam, and the more they come closer to Islam. So Islam is not a terrorist religion. Islam, Islam doesn't promote terrorism. Islam has a military policy. The Quran is a constitution. It's a, law. It's a book of law, just like the Mosaic law. Okay? It has a foreign policy. It has a military policy. It has rules of engagement with the enemy. It has all of that. And it is very, very clear that we cannot cross the line, the limits. Okay? For example, uh, in uh, chapter 2 of the Quran, verse 190 to 192, these three verses explain that even in war, even in war, when Muslims are engaging the enemy, you cannot transgress limits. And now, uh, one big question as to what this means, transgression of limits. What does this mean? So we are told, we are taught by the example of the Prophet himself, that transgression in war is killing men who are not part of the war, killing women, killing children, killing monks, destroying buildings, burning crops, killing enemy, even animals. Killing animals, unless you're going to devour them for food, and don't even scatter bees. If you see a beehive, don't scatter it. This is the rules in Islam. Okay, Don't demolish churches. Do not persecute monks who are, who are secluded in the churches. So these are some of the rules we find in the Hadith. For example, Kitab al-Jihad, Muattai of Imam Malik. It is there. Uh, the rules I gave you, ten rules, are uh, well known. They are there. So anyone who accuses Islam of spreading or promoting terrorism is simply uh, ill-informed and is not aware of our history. Because our history is full of wars, full of conflicts, full of uh, civil wars, and you will find anything but uh, terrorism. Of course, there are people who made mistakes, people who committed atrocities, people who did things for selfish reasons, but you cannot attribute those things to Islam. Those were individual actions which were done by people for their own political or personal gains. And then there are other misconceptions about Islam, having dealt with this conception, misconception about Islam, that Islam promotes terrorism somehow. We move on. So another misconception about Islam is that Islam is not progressive. Islam is regressive. Islam causes people to become very backward, very narrow-minded, and very conservative, very reserved. You know you don't like to smile, you're very miserable, you don't like to enjoy your lives, you know, you just like to pray five times a day and then eat, go to the toilet and die. <laughs> this, is, this is not what our life is about. And to the contrary, you know, I lived a life outside of Islam. Twelve years ago, I was living a life outside of Islam and I enjoy myself more. Right now as we speak, I, I travel more, I meet more people, and I do more things, right? I do horse riding, I sometimes uh, do swimming as well, okay? Sometimes, uh, for example, I was recently in Zanzibar. You know Zanzibar? Has anyone been to Zanzibar? Okay. It's a beautiful place, right? It's, it's, it's like paradise on earth. It's a beautiful place, okay? 
And I, I was there. I was walking on those white sandy beaches. It was beautiful. And I was there for a purpose. The purpose was to give dawah to those tourists who come there. But we couldn't give dawah for uh, very difficult reasons. Okay, so we had to uh, we had to come back to our base because it was very difficult to give dawah there <coughs> for obvious reasons because we were getting dawah there. <laughs> so so we do enjoy ourselves. Okay, we are not a miserable people. We are a very happy people. We have limits. We do not cross those limits. But within those limits, we enjoy our lives. We read, we study, we go on holidays, we uh, do all those things one can do without harming oneself. For example, we don't drink alcohol because we've been told it is bad for you. Period. Now, the Quran tells us that, by the way. In chapter 5 again, Ya Ayyadamina Amun, what's the verse? Inna mal qamru wal maysru wal ansabu wal azlamu rijisu min amali shaytan. Abstain from, abstain from gambling, drinking, and fortune telling or throwing arrows for luck. Abstain from these things as they are bad for you. If you want to prosper in life, abstain. And this is not only drinking, any intoxicant. There's a term used in the Quran, khamr. Khamr means any intoxicant, whether it's hashish or, you know, weed or ecstasy or what other new types they have invented nowadays. They use drugs or pubs, okay, or drinking alcohol. All of these things are bad for you. Now, even if you look at the, the secular system today, or non-religious uh, scientific research, as they put it sometimes, you will see that alcohol consumption is linked to the majority of violent crimes in Britain. Some even suggest 80% of violent crimes are alcohol-related. Alcohol is bad. It is absolutely bad. It has no benefit whatsoever. Speaking generally, it has no benefit. But it, it is still being sold. It still causes thousands of deaths. By the way, alcohol causes more deaths than any form of terrorism has ever caused. Do you agree? Do you agree? Or am I making things up? Do you agree? Yeah. Can't hear you. Do you have food? Do you have energy to answer my question? Do you agree? Yes. Okay. So alcohol has caused alcohol, tobacco or smoking or, you know, heroin, cocaine. These people have caused more, uh, these things have caused more deaths than any act of terrorism ever has. Okay. More than September the 11th or even uh, the terrorism we saw in Iraq. Uh, at the hands of the U.S. Uh, you know, government, where over two to three million people have been killed. Okay, one of the biggest uh, examples of terrorism in recent history. Okay, even more than that, alcohol has killed more people than that. Okay, so when people argue that we are regressive, we are not. We are progressive because of our values. Our ethics come from Allah. They come from God. We follow them and we prosper. If we are not following the teachings of Islam, then we have problems, right? But when we follow the teachings of Islam strictly, take Islam very seriously, we live happy. It is us who harms ourselves, who go against the teachings of God and start to harm ourselves, okay? It is us who are responsible for our demise and for our decline, not the other way around, not God Almighty. He has revealed the scriptures to us. And he has told us what is good for you, what is bad for you. When we follow these teachings, we, pro we make progress. When we don't follow these teachings, we go back, we go behind. So Islam in that sense is progressive because Islam made more progress uh, than any other system in the history of mankind. And I claim this boldly. To this day, Islam was a system which made more progress than any other system on the planet. It depends on how you define progress. I don't define progress by having technological advancement or having jets, F-35s and B-52 bombers or warships and things like this. I don't define progress like that. I, what I define progress, uh, or the way I define progress is by looking at how happy people are in a society. How much cohesion you have in a society. How much harmony do you have in a society? How tolerant are the people of a society? 
Okay, how many educated people you find in a society? How much benefit is that education bringing to the people of that society? This is how this is how I measure uh, progress. Not what you see in Scandinavia or in Finland or in Japan. Some of the most advanced countries on the planet, Japan, for example, with one of the highest suicide rates in the world. And what causes suicide? Depression causes suicide. You're not happy with your life. Even though you have all that technology, the cars and the calculators and gadgets and new things, but you're not happy. You want to kill yourself. And there's a jungle in Japan somewhere. I don't know what this jungle is called. It's a park or a jungle. They find people hanging themselves almost every single day. Right? I met someone from Finland in Malawi. I was recently in Africa in Malawi. Amazingly, I find the people of Malawi are very happy. And the kind of poverty they suffer is unimaginable for most of you people. You cannot imagine the kind of poverty these people live in, but they are some of the happiest people on the planet. They will have smiles on their faces. I don't think anyone is committing suicide in Malawi. You will struggle to find someone who doesn't believe in God in Malawi or in Africa, generally speaking. But here, in Western Europe, with all your glory, all your education, all your technology, all your progress, you are suffering from depression. One of the highest suicide rates in the world is in Scandinavian states. Increasingly atheists. Right? They are suffering from atheism. One of the biggest problems is that they have divorced God from their lives. God doesn't exist. So I'm going to lead my own life. And when you lead your own life, you eventually end up dying, killing, taking your life. Okay, there's nothing more to do. I've had ecstasy, I've had cocaine, I've had my alcohol, I've had 50 girlfriends and 50 boyfriends. Okay, and then I've had sheep and cow and cat as well. Okay, so now what? There's nothing else. What, what, what next? What next? Nothing next. Kill yourself. Okay, so what? The, the stories we hear in Europe, right? Uh, not that these problems don't exist in the Muslim world. I'm not that blind. I know these problems do exist in the Muslim world, but not on that scale. And the problems uh, have brought, have been brought to the Muslim world from outside, right? We didn't have these problems on this scale. Never. To this day, never. We've ha we haven't had these problems this scale. Okay, the problem of bestiality, the problem of incest, the problem of uh, rape, even rape. Rape. You would be shocked to hear this, that there are 147 rapes taking place every single day in Britain. Every single day. This is old statistics, by the way. Uh, I don't know what the recent number is. Okay, and again in the US, Every three minutes, two women are raped. Okay? Um, then, when we talk about crime and other problems, for example, you know, 50,000 people have died in the last year in Mexico due to drugs, uh, violence, you know, cartels fighting each other. Or, you know, El Salvador, which is around the corner from the US, right? You know this country, El Salvador? Yes? Two gangs around the country. Did you know that? One is called M23 and the other one is, I don't know what it's called, something 18. Uh, two gangs from prisons, they run these countries. Okay, grown men bearing like kids. They have a reputation to defend. They have tattoos all over their bodies. Okay, they have lost their purpose in life. This is what happens when you divorce God from your lives. So, Islam causes you to submit to the ultimate authority. The all-wise, the all-powerful, God Almighty. Once you listen to His wisdom and follow it, you prosper. Now, I will say something very controversial today. Very controversial. Even if Islam was not true, listen carefully, even, Allah forbid, even if Islam was not true, even if God doesn't exist, even if Islam as a system is still the best system on the planet. Islam still works. As a system, it still works. Even if God doesn't exist, and even if Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, Audhu Billah, Thumma Audhu Billah was a liar. Even if that was the case. Islam, amazingly, still has solutions to our problems. And this is why I believe it has to be from the divine. It has to be from the divine. It is not a man-made religion or a man-made system because uh, when man makes solutions or proposes solutions to our problems, these solutions are always subjective, right? Subjective in the sense that when you will ask people to pass laws against an evil in society, you will always get subjective results. Let me give you an example. 
And I'm talking about as to why Islam is progressive. You go to a parliament and you try to ban alcohol in a country, for example. And we have already established that alcohol is bad for the society. We know that. No one will disagree with that. I don't think anyone is insane enough to come forward today and say that alcohol is good for the society. What's wrong with you? That's not going to happen. Okay? Alcohol is bad for the society. You go to a parliament and 90% of the parliament drinks. They have their pint or their lager or whatever they like to have. Oh. Every now and then they have to, they like to have a drink. So you propose this law to ban alcohol in the country, even though everyone knows that it is bad for the society. Will you ever get a law against alcohol? Answer my question. Yeah. Why not? They had a pro prohibition in America, which was made by the ruling class at that particular time. But just that the people weren't invited by it, but they actually made the rule, they banned alcohol in America. It was called prohibition. You remember that? For certain times. It doesn't matter, but they still did it. And it was actually the government which actually voted yeah. against that. That restriction is here as well in Britain. After 11 o'clock. Uh, no, 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 the prohibition was that you could not sell alcohol publicly. And you couldn't brew it and you couldn't take to that. Wait, which area of the US you're talking about? It's Where? The prohibition in America. Yes. Sorry, anyone knows about this? Yes. So, so the point is, you will not get a law according to this secular system against, for example, the gun lobby in America. The guns are causing major destruction in the society. People walk into schools and then just spray everyone with Uzis and whatever automatic weapons they can get their hands on. They go and they wantonly kill people, right? So, why is Obama struggling to pass laws against guns or limit the sale of guns in the U.S.? Because many of these senators who are in the Senate are investors in the guns business, right? I'll give you another example. William Wilberforce. Have you heard of him? Anyone? Yes, yeah. William Wilberforce, the anti-slave activist, right? Anti-slavery activist, rather. Uh, he was one of the only one of the only voices in Britain, prominent voices, to fight against slavery, and one of the even fewer in the Parliament. So when he was trying to get a law passed against slavery in its worst form ever practiced in the history of mankind, I don't know what happened with the Egyptians and the Greeks and the Romans, but Atlantic slave trade, they used to brand humans as animals, they used to use them in, uh, in uh, sugarcane industry and most of these people used to die. Most of these people died. 90% of slaves went to Brazil okay, in sugarcane industry. And most of them died before the age of 20 or 24, something like that. Okay? So, this was one of the worst kinds of slavery, which, uh, which is what William Wilberforce was fighting. And the British Parliament, all of them knew it is evil. They all agreed it is evil. But he was struggling to get a law against slavery because most of these parliamentarians, MPs, had their investments in sugar industry in the West Indies. So they couldn't pass a law against it. So men, when they pass laws, when they propose solutions, these solutions are subjective, limited by scope, based upon their limited knowledge and limited conceptions, limited con conditioning and limited experience. Man, all of us put together, we have limited knowledge. We don't know everything and uh, all the solutions we need for our society. We don't. Even if we come together and brainstorm, our solutions will have problems somewhere. So that's why we have chosen a higher authority, God Almighty, the Creator, who we believe in, who we know definitely exists, by looking at the signs around us, He is the one who gives us solutions. So you do this, you will prosper. You don't do this, you will suffer. So when we actually do it, when we practice what He has revealed, we prosper. And when we put it aside, we suffer. So, why is it right? And why is it wrong? So these misconceptions about Islam, that Islam is regressive, not progressive, are misconceptions. And this is not true. Our history again testifies to this fact that we have made more progress, eth ethically, morally or, even, morally or even technologically, we made a lot of progress in our past. Uh, and we, can still, we still have the potential to do the same again. So 
We are not regressive, we are progressive as long as we practice our religion properly, we take the teachings of the Qur'an seriously. Another misconception which we have is about the rights of women, okay? And I don't want to do this comparison between the woman, uh, the state of woman in the West and the state of woman in the East or the state of woman in Islam, okay? In Islam, uh, I will quickly break it down as to how Muslims or Islam dignified uh, the status of woman, historically speaking, okay? Women were effectively liberated by the Qur'an. Qur'an was revealed and the Qur'an now had put women on an equal pale with men. So chapter 33 of the Qur'an, verse 35, there's a verse which talks about Al-Mu'minat, Al-Mu'mineen, Al-Qanitin, and the verse goes like this, addressing both men and women together, that believing men and believing women, okay? Uh, praying men and praying women, right? Pious men and pious women, right? All of them will have reward from their God. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created them, right? So in Islam, the Quran put them equally. Spiritually, as far as, far as reward and punishment is concerned, they were put equally, right? But then, recognizing the difference between two genders, right? Men and women are equal but not the same. They're not the same. Unless you're going to shock me. <laughs> okay? Men and women are not the same. Hence, different rules apply to them. So God applies different rules on them. Right? And women made more progress in the history of Islam than in any other system. In fact, Islam produced more educated women than ever before. In, in, in our recorded history. In the recorded history of humanity, until the 20th century, Islam was producing more educated women than ever before. Uh, for example, there's a book written on this very topic by a scholar uh, who is uh, teaching in Oxford, Sheikh Akram Nadwi, uh, who has written a book on uh, the history of uh, women scholars of hadith. Hadith is a science, it effectively is history, historians. Uh, so when he started to write this book, he thought he will possibly end up with one or two volumes because he struggled to find uh, woman biographies in the books of histories. But he ended up with 40 volumes. 40 volumes on the history of women scholars in the history of Islam. So the book is titled al Muhaddithat. The first volume, the, the introduction, is in English. You can find it. The rest is in Arabic. Uh, and those of you who can read Arabic can benefit from it. Otherwise, the first volume summarizes the, the entire history quite nicely. It is titled al Muhaddithat by Akram Nadwi, A-K-R-A-M, N-A-W, N-A-D-W-I, Akram Nadwi. So if you Google his name, you'll find the book. So, Islam liberated women, gave more rights to women, more dignity and honor to women. In fact, the Prophet of Islam, peace be upon him, he said that those of you who take care of two daughters will be like this, will be in paradise, this clothes. And the man stood up and he said, Ya Rasulullah, what about one daughter? He didn't say sons. He didn't say sons. He's effectively telling his followers, you want to enter paradise? You want to have eternal bliss? Then take care of two daughters. While prior to this, previously, the Arabs used to take their daughters as their burden. Right? And a lot of them used to kill their daughters. And it wasn't considered to be anything bad. In fact, it was taken as a sign of manhood, manliness. You go and kill your daughter. If you have a daughter, I don't need a daughter. You just go. And, you used to keep enough alive to have children with them, right? So now the Quran comes and Quran turns the tables and says, "Those of you, or the Prophet comes and he says, those of you who take care of two daughters will be in paradise with me like this." And a man said, "He said, what about one daughter?" He said, "Even one daughter, right?" And then he tells his companions, his people, those who are listening to him, that Al Jannah to Tahta Akdam that your paradise is under the feet of your mothers. It's under the feet of your mothers. You want paradise? Serve your mothers and you will have paradise. So these are some of the reports we find in Islam. And in fact, when we read the Quran, uh, after condemning one of the biggest sins is polytheism, uh, Allah talks about, or He warns believers about the rights of parents. And be kind to your parents. So, uh, mothers, of course, take precedence over fathers, and we have many reports to prove that. So, 
Islam dignified women more than any other system in history. So, these are some of the misconceptions I like to discuss. The basic, the most prominent ones, the most uh, heavily fostered ones, the ones which are pushed down your throat day and night, every single day. You hear them again and again and you're so sick of them. Even some Islamophobic websites and, uh, and some of the uh, news channels and some uh, YouTube channels and other and on Facebook, you come across these things and you feel frustrated. We have to work harder, we have to talk to the masses, we have to talk our to our brothers and sisters in humanity. Uh, the people of this country are very tolerant, they are very open to hear the truth, and in fact they are very soft. Okay, I was traveling from, uh, from Dubai to, uh, to London this last week, and there was a lady sitting next to me. Uh, she was watching uh, the new movie Diana. No, don't ask me how I know that because I can see she's watching Diana. So I could see that when the movie ended, she was crying. She was shedding tears. So I said, why is she crying? And then I watched the film, uh, the end, the part as well, yeah? I went on there and I wanted to see why is she crying. And I watched the end. And it's like, she dies, uh, you know, in such a pitiful state. She has an accident. She's in love with a doctor, a Pakistani guy, by the way. <laughs> and... He goes and he places flowers and then he has a quote of Rumi. Rumi was a poet that there is a garden between uh, the right and the wrong and I will meet you in that garden. So she was crying having seen that scene. So I realized this is so, these people are so soft. You know, if you actually take information to them, if you talk to them, they will listen. They will change. They're not cruel. They're not cruel people. Not everyone is from EDL, by the way. Okay? In this country. The majority are a very tolerant loving and compassionate people. We just have to take the message of Islam to them and break the barriers and you see what happens. Thank you very much for listening. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and I welcome questions. Thank you so much. So now you're free to ask questions. Uh, any questions on Islam because the topic is quite general. This conception is Islam. Uh, please, I'll come to you in a minute. Please, please. You say Islam is the Solution to the problems. Could you define and explain what the main problem and the large problem is? Uh, the biggest problem mankind is facing? Secularism. <laughs> That's my view. When you divorce God from your affairs, when you divorce God from your affairs, um, then you are a cosmic orphan. I don't know if that makes sense. Okay? <laughs> A cosmic orphan is someone who says, we have a father, but he comes to his father and he says, get lost, I don't need you. Okay, and you're a child, five years old, and you go on the streets. What's going to happen to you? What do you think is going to happen to you? So we have chosen to divorce God from our lives. You get stuck for a lot on this, but you, you're telling God to go away. We'll sort our own problems out, and we are facing disasters and destructions. So I believe secularism is the biggest problem mankind is facing, and one of the biggest or the worst uh, catastrophes in our history was uh, the 20th century. Okay, The bloodiest century of the history of mankind. Where we had secular conflicts and it, uh, these conflicts caused more deaths than all of uh, mankind's history put together. I don't know if you agree with me, but I can give you the figures if you want. 200 million people died because of two world wars. And the third one is about to kick off now. Uh, may God save us. Okay? Uh, due to Ukraine. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, uh, I think that gentleman was before you. Please. Uh, you talked about Islam being progressive and liberating for women. I don't know enough Quranic scripture to dispute that, so I'll accept it. So what would you say to rule makers in places like Saudi Arabia, where mm. they've yet to extend the right to vote or even the right to drive? Right. Women? Right. Okay. Very good question. Uh, very good question. Uh, you see, not every society opposes democracy as a system to govern. Okay. Not every society works like that. China is not a democracy. Okay. China is not a democracy. Very. They've made a lot of progress technologically. China is possibly one of the biggest uh, uh, economies on the planet, or upcoming economies on the planet. So. Like Saudi Arabia, it has a very unique culture, not entirely Islamic, possibly. There are problems there, which we can resolve and sort out. But Saudi Arabia has its own culture, 
So we in the West have no right to impose our system or use our system as a yardstick to judge their system. Okay? We can only judge their system if, uh, if their system is not producing more results than our system. There is less crime in Saudi Arabia. There are less rapes in Saudi Arabia. Uh, there are less uh, problems with regards to women in Saudi Arabia. For example, in, in this country, uh, I was watching a news report last night that uh, one third of European women are sexually assaulted at work. Did anyone come across this report yesterday on Al Jazeera? One third, one third, that is, that is 33% of European women sexually assaulted, I'll come and to you. 40,000, 40, like just a cluster, and amongst them, one third were raped. So it's now that the whole of the European society had this, but out of 40,000 question, people questioned, right. then they estimated that one third would have been right. abused. So out of those 40,000? Yeah, the actual cluster was 40,000. Yeah. Yeah. So still makes my point very, very strong. Uh, so, 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 it wasn't quite how I meant the question. Right. So what I meant was, is how does that compare with your understanding of the Quranic teaching on the, you know, the, the, the freedom of women within society? Would I, you say I, that is a correct application of it? Right. Or would you say that they have misunderstood or that there's a deeper level of complexity to it within the context of Islam? I, I, instead of uh, walking into a framed discussion based upon framed terms, I would ask you to define freedom. What do you mean by well, freedom? No, that's, that's what I mean. That's what I'm asking you to right. define. Freedom. Said, how does the freedom of women apply within the context right. well, I mean, of the, That's what I'm asking. Well, well, this is what I'm trying to understand. What do you mean by freedom of women? What, how do you define freedom of women? When you say freedom of women, what, what do you want your freedom for? If we go with the basic, with the basic sort of level of... We have no yeah, consensus. Then, well, yes. that's, what, that's what I'm asking. If yeah. I've got a basic definition of freedom to be the freedom of any individual... Which is what? Which is what? In, wait, sure, sure, sure. To act in a way that is largely permissible for any other individual. Right. Uh, as in you have a base level that covers all of humanity. Right. If that isn't the same as... Your sure. definition, sure. which if it isn't, that's perfectly reasonable. Okay. Okay. Then, what is the definition of freedom and liberation that you're operating on? That, thank you. That we can better understand the differences right. we see. Our, our definitions come from the divine. Mm -hmm. Okay? So, our definition of our understanding of freedom comes from God. Okay? We don't define terms ourselves. So, when terms are being defined by God, for example, we believe that once we submit ourselves to God, or once we enslave ourselves to God, we attain ultimate freedom. Right? So this is what our definition of freedom is. But when you go to humans to define freedom, it may vary from time to time, from place to place, from people to people. For example, freedom for women in Scandinavian states is something different to freedom in Canada. For example, in Canada, women can walk around topless on the streets of Toronto or Ontario or wherever. Okay? In London, it's a crime. You go and walk topless. A woman cannot walk topless on Oxford Street. She would be arrested immediately. But if a man is walking topless, no problem. Okay? So, freedom is relative. It, it is a very subjective area, depending on societies and cultures and countries and places and people. Right? But we, our definition is static for the last 14 centuries. Freedom means what God tells you you're free to do. Right? So women, they are free to do certain things, they're not free to do other things. Men are free to do certain things, and they're not free to do other things. Children are free to do certain things, and they cannot do other things. So our definition is quite strict, static, and it works perfectly well, and it produces amazing results. I hope that clarifies the picture somehow. Uh, please. Uh, there's just a few points that I'd like to pick up on what you said. Regarding suicide in Scandinavia, I'm part Icelandic, and for, to, for half the year there, because uh, it's so far up north, there's like no sunlight, so there'll be like two or three hours sunlight a day. Hmm. And I suspect that's actually the cause of suicide. In J Japan has plenty of sunlight. Um, yeah, I don't know, but I just wanted to set things straight about Scandinavia. Sure. Right. Um, uh, yeah, also, I think. Uh, it's not. It just seems a bit unfair to say uh, what the Western media is doing is 
similar to what the Nazis did to the Jews, because I think that was a little bit, you know, like... Extreme? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, well, I'm a Muslim, what do you expect? <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think, you see, you see, with, with the Nazis, they, they had a free hand, or they had freedom to, to report on Jews as they liked. They had, they had a view of the Jews, they believed the Jews have certain qualities in their view, right? And they made those qualities appear very ugly in the press, right? Likewise, uh, there are some people, some shadowy characters, people we do not see behind media machines who are pumping this poison in the minds of the people and they have a view of the Muslims and they, no, what has a dog or, 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 or a taxi driver not allowing, allowing a dog in his, into his taxi got to do with Islam? Okay, so when they will report on this they will say a Muslim driver did not allow a dog into his taxi. Okay, a Muslim man uh, stole a hundred thousand pounds from a hospital. A Muslim man sold drugs. But on the other hand, when Phil Pot, someone like Phil Pot, who killed six of his children, right? Six? How many? Right? You won't see a Christian man kill the six children. Now, all of these people who are committing these crimes, how Muslim are they? That's the question. How Muslim are they? Okay, but they will always label that crime as an Islamic crime. But when someone else commits a crime... Uh, whether that person is black or white or Christian or not Christian doesn't really matter. They won't label that crime as a religious crime. So this is where the difference is. Just like the Nazis were doing with the Jews. Okay, they were saying every crime is Jewish. Every single Jew who commits a crime, that crime is Jewish in nature because they have a plan to dominate the world. They have uh, these uh, protocols of the end. Sorry. I think they were doing a bit more than that. You know, they were saying. Well, the same thing is happening to the Muslims. Muslims are inferior because Muslims uh, are backward. They, these are medieval people. That, that's how we portray. I, I, I think you're portraying a false image of how the mass what European people view Islam. And I think that that's actually destructive in a sense. Right. So I, I don't think the majority of... I, I'm only highlighting the problem. At all. Like, I'm only highlighting the problem. Yeah, yeah. I may be wrong. I may be wrong, but I, I'm trying to highlight the problem as I see it. Please. <laughs> I don't think, true, true enough, that I don't think the um, problem that Islam is facing with the media and things like that is quite as bad as what has happened with, with Jews in the Holocaust. But as a person who, I have been persecuted because of my religion. I come from an area where people threw, threw bricks at me, um, people tried to rip my headscarf off. I was made to feel like rubbish every single day. I didn't want to go to school because people really treated me awful. And I don't want that to happen to people en masse in Islam. And if we allow the situation to get worse and to like snowball, it is going to be another Holocaust. And we should learn from history, learn from what happened, and actually try and work together. Not, not saying um, your values have to be the same as mine, but coming together in celebration of, of, of our differences and trying to work together in, instead of trying to just set, um, you know, scapegoat or bl blame a certain proportion of the population for, for having certain beliefs about being, you know, doing silly things. There are, have been Muslims who have done stupid things and I'm sure most people in here will be condemning them for doing stupid no, things. No, there, there are people from all kind of backgrounds exactly, doing stupid exactly. things, okay? I mean, I can give you examples, so many examples, but they're not, they're not highlighted. Those problems, those crimes are not highlighted uh, the way Muslim crimes are highlighted. And we need to, we need to work together as, as a global community to stop that from happening so that we don't have people who don't want to go to school because they feel like they're being persecuted. In fact, you know, my, my sister, she lived in the same place. She was actually locked in a, in a changing room for hours. She's got asthma and she, she nearly had an asthma attack. That's, that's because she's a Muslim and that's something which we need to stop. We, you know, people shouldn't have to deal with it. Not just Muslims, that should be the case for everyone. No one should have to go through those problems. 
but it seems like because of media influences and these kinds of things, it's becoming a more prevalent problem. We need to deal with that as a community. Thank you. because of the missionary activity. There were Portuguese in Goa. They were, they were Christians there to this day. And uh, Christians were protected under the domination of Islam. In fact, during the Mughal period, the Christians were prosperous. And pr Christians have uh, existed for the last 60 years in Pakistan um, unmolested. It was only recently uh, when things went wrong politically in Pakistan. Now, there are many people involved in Pakistan. Pakistan is a very complicated situation. Okay, there was a bomb blast recently in, uh, in, in, in the capital, in the court, right? And three or six days ago, I was walking through that corridor myself. <laughs> I was only two days early, okay? Uh, so, uh, there are people doing these blasts who are not known. These are shadowy characters. People are claiming these uh, blasts and saying, we did it. But there are so many agencies or so many foreign agencies involved in Pakistan. That's a, and that's a hidden secret. There, there is CIA there. There is Blackwaters there. There is a raw Indian raw there. And there are... What about the law of the land? The law of the land protects the Christian. The constitution of Pakistan, even though it's not Islamic, as it stands today, not fully Islamic, it protects the Christians. Iran there, there's a lot of Islamic nation. Sorry? Iran is not Islamic nation. Same thing happens there. Where, like where? In Iran. So in Iran, yeah. how did the Christians survive for 2,000 years or last 15 centuries? It doesn't really matter. The point is, no, but the point is if, 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 Muslims had, if Muslims had an anti-Christian or anti-Jewish policy, yeah. the Jews would have been annihilated or there wouldn't be any Hindus in India. Did you know that? <laughs> Muslims in the time of Aurangzeb Alamgir, who was a king who governed from the year 1658 to 1707 for 50 years, the most powerful Muslim king who ever governed India. And he governed 95% of the country. He could have easily forced the entire country into Islam. Islam doesn't, Muslims do not have an anti-Jewish or anti-Hindu or anti-non-Muslim policy. Okay? But it's okay it, to execute them if they commit blasphemy. No, if... No. No, okay, the, no, okay wait, know. wait. The law of the land, yeah. the law of the land states that you may prosper in this land, you may do business in this land, you may live as you like, but do not insult the prophet of Islam in this land. And, Just and like here in Britain, in Britain, I don't agree with paying council tax. I don't want to pay council tax. I don't want to pay council A thousand pounds? What for? Why? For living in my house? Yeah. Okay. But if I don't pay that, if I don't pay that tax, yeah. if I don't obey the law of the land, yeah. what happens to me? You get in prison. Thank you. Yeah. Plus, you that's all I have to say. Okay. No, not believe. If you want to insult the prophet of Islam. An Islamic country is not the place to do that. It's not the place to do that. Okay. Likewise, if I don't want to pay council tax, go back to Pakistan. Simple. Right? That's what I would do. If I don't want to pay council tax, what am I doing here? Uh, that lady will please. As to um, what's standing the hadith as in um, Islam? What's standing? Hadith is uh, a complementary source to the Quran. The Quran is the pure, uncorrupted word of God. Okay? Delivered from the Prophet, peace be upon him. Uh, hadith is the word of the Prophet. Okay? Uh, hadith, for example, uh, is the prophetic tradition, which explains the Quran, which explains the Quran being practiced. Right? So that's what the, the, the stature of Hadith is in, the Quran, in Islam. Okay, I have a question about that. Right. Uh, what you're... Right. Go ahead, please. Um, correct me if I misunderstood, but I... 
been doing a bit of reading on it, and I came up to a passage where it said that the Prophet Muhammad said that if you had a dream of a black woman, that meant danger was coming, or something like that. I mean, like, well, you laugh, but that's what I came across. And I okay, uh, you okay. where did you come across this? That's the question. Okay, I came across it online, and if you'd like to correct Okay, me. online you will find uh, Adnan Rashid, who is not me. <laughs> okay, online you will find things about Islam which are not true. Online you, online you will find things about the Prophet of Islam which are not true. So this is a, a false attribution to the Prophet. In fact, the Prophet of Islam, he stated in a report to the contrary. Are you, are you paying attention? So I'm just trying to give you a report. Prophet, Prophet of Islam said that uh, an Arab has no superiority over a non-Arab. Okay, a white has no superiority over a black. Okay. And in the sight of God, those who have taqwa, who have got consciousness, are the best people. Okay, to paraphrase the report. Okay, and in fact, one of his companions was uh, uh, an Abyssinian slave, Bilal bin Rabah, and he considered him to be one of the best people among his companions. In fact, one of his Arab companions, a very proud Arab from the, the tribe of uh, uh, what's his name, Abu Zar al Ghifari, from the tribe of Ghifar. Ghifar was a tribe in Arabia, they were considered to be the bad boys, okay? They were the, the mafia of the Arabian Peninsula. You don't want to mess with Ghifar. This is how it was, okay? You don't want to mess with the people of Ghifar because they, they had a very strong, um, you know, uh, uh, how can I put it? A very, very uh, imposing, very imposing impression, right? So Ghifar were a very proud people. So this man, Abu Dhar al-Ghifari, he insulted Bilal by calling him a son of a black slave woman, right? Bilal goes straight to the Prophet, that this is what Abu Dhar said to me. And Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Prophet Muhammad, he asked him to come, he came and he said, you are a man who still have ignorance inside your heart. You are a man who still have jahaliya. Ignorance is not the right word for jahaliya, by the way. Jahaliya means uh, that from the time of disbelief, you still have those beliefs inside you. And Abu Dhar, he said that I was so ashamed. Are you listening? Okay. <laughs> I was so ashamed. I was so ashamed that I wish I wasn't born until that day when the Prophet was hurt in this way. So this is one job he did, the Prophet of Islam. He got rid of racism. In fact, he stated in a very famous report, Hadith, which is authentic, by the way, that anyone, man da'a ila ma'asiyatin, Anyone who calls to racism, tribalism, or nationalism is not one of, one of us. Anyone who fights for nationalism, racism, or tribalism is not one of us. Anyone who dies for nationalism, racism, and... Um, and what? What other ism was that? <laughs> no. Is not one of us. So, Asabiya is a very comprehensive term which covers tribalism, nationalism, and racism. All of that comes under Asabiyah. So the Prophet of Islam made it very clear. So this is the clearest conception that we have any uh, anti... In fact, the Prophet of Islam, he stated in another report, to give you a report, I do apologize, yeah, in Sahih Muslim, Kitab al Imara, he said, if a black slave has been appointed a ruler over you, so long as he governs you with the Quran, obey him. Obey him. This was unbelievable and unimaginable for the Arabs to hear this with their own ears. Was un and this is how the Prophet... He got rid of racism from the people and they became brothers in one faith. I hope that answers your question.